The Eldar once ruled the galaxy, able to extinguish stars with naught but a thought and unchallenged for domination by any other race. And yet, this proved their undoing. They fell into arrogance, indulging their every women desire, and over time this pleasure and excess reflected in the warp. Sometime during the 29th millennium, this reflection was birthed into existence as the chaos god Slanesh, who wiped out the large majority of the race who had created her in an event known as the Fall of the Eldar. Ever since, the Eldar have been a declining and dying species, clinging to existence through their combat prowess, psychic mastery, and wraith constructs. In this dark time, there are some who have become legends to the children of Asayan. Today, we delve into a group who have shaped the militant aspect of the Eldar, incomparable warriors responsible for the aspect shrines now present on almost all surviving craft worlds. They are the Phoenix Lords, the embodiments of the bloody-handed god Kayla Mensha Kane. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. When Slanesh, known to the Eldar as She Who Thirsts, was born, she unleashed a psychic stream that rent the souls of all Eldar within many thousand light years. Only those hidden within the wraith bone hulls of the furthest flung craft worlds or exodite worlds, or those sheltered within the pocket dimension of Komara, were safe from the initial assault that cost untold billions of lives amongst not only the Eldar, but humanity and other races the galaxy over. These souls were swallowed up by Slanesh, and she gorged on them. With the immense psychic power of their race known to all across the galaxy, it is little surprise that she who thirsts found the Eldar soul the most delicious, and ever since she has claimed the soul of every dead Eldar to sate her voracious appetite. The Eldar have found ways to attempt to avoid this fate. The Harlequins rely on their patron god Chegarak to preserve their souls, whilst the Dark Eldar simply do not intend on dying, and so sacrifice others to maintain their vitality. As for the Craftworld Eldar, they use devices known as Spirit Stones to store the psychic energy of their souls so as they never enter the warp at all. These stones are stored in an infinity circuit upon a Craftworld unless they are placed into a Wraith Construct in order to defend it. Without the Spirit Stones, the Phoenix Lords simply would not exist. Following the fall, Eldar society underwent a drastic and dramatic reorganisation. Rather than be permitted to indulge their vices as they had once done, every Eldar instead follows regimented disciplines known as the Paths. The various Paths teach the Eldar skills and enrich their souls, all whilst forbidding them from attaining the extreme emotions that had initially birthed Slanesh. All Eldar walk many paths in their lives, but there is risk involved. It is possible that an Eldar can become trapped on one path, unable to focus their mind on another discipline, these individuals are said to be lost on their respective paths, and whilst they cannot deviate from said path, they become masters of it. The Farseers, the greatest visionaries and psychers of the Eldar, are said to be lost upon the path of the Seer, while those known as Exarchs are those on the path of the Warrior. The Phoenix Lords were the first of the Exarchs, who would go on to found the Aspect Shrines now used to train those who walk the path of the Warrior. They were mostly born around the time of the fall, and those who were, were trained by the first exarch, a sermon, Hand of Asa Yan, Lord of the Eldar Gods. Almost all of them have died at least once, but the Phoenix Lords are pseudo-immortal thanks to their spirit stones. Their ornate war suits contain a spirit stone that contains the soul of the original Phoenix Lord. When they are slain, the suit becomes dormant, until a mighty exarch is chosen from their shrine to don the armour and become the Phoenix Lord. The exarch's soul is absorbed into the spirit stone, but always the dominant personality will be that of the original bearer. Therefore, being chosen to become a Phoenix Lord could be seen as a form of suicide for the exarch, as their soul is suppressed beneath the original Lord. But it could just as easily be construed as a sacrifice, so as the mightiest of their aspect can live on through them in a similar fashion to the young king, another type of exarch, rousing the avatar of Cain. The Phoenix Lords themselves do not have a home. The one they established was destroyed, and now they wander the craft worlds and Eldar-held planets, training warriors or establishing new shrines where needed.
There are currently 14 known aspect shrines, each representing a different part of Kayla Mensha Kane, but only 9 known Phoenix Lords. It is assumed in most cases that the unknown lords were killed on a planet far away from any shrine or Eldar civilizations, and so their suit is lost until a fated exarch sets out to find and don it. In the case of the warp spider aspect, it is instead theorised that their phoenix lord is in fact a warrior known as the wraith spider, but this is unsubstantiated, as the story of becoming the wraith spider differs from that of the other phoenix lords. The other four aspects currently without a known phoenix lord are the Crimson Hunters, who secure the skies for the Eldar, as well as three aspects of unknown function, the Ebon Talons, the Crystal Dragons, and the Slicing Orbs of Xandros, an aspect unique to the craft world of the same name. It would be difficult to speculate on the roles of these aspects, as their names are somewhat cryptic. It's the Eldar, after all. I would suspect that the Ebon Talons are a melee aspect, possibly the counterpart to the Swooping Hawks by the Avian reference, i.e. fast-moving melee troops. The Slicing Orbs may be a Craftworld-specific variant of the Dire Avengers Shrine, whilst the Crystal Dragons are completely incomprehensible in nature, at least to me. With the background of the Aspect Warriors and the Phoenix Lords now established, we can delve into the individual warriors and their shrines. We begin with a sermon, first of all Exarchs and his Shrine of the Dire Avengers. A sermon was originally known as Iliathin, and he and his brother Tethesis were both caught up in the fall. Tethesis was possessed by a demon after both brothers somehow survived the birth of she who thirsts, forcing Iliathin to kill him before taking refuge in a temple. There he contemplated suicide for several years, hidden from the demons because of the lingering presence of the Eldar gods within the temple. He was found by a girl called Ferethel, whom he turned away until she came under attack from the Dark Eldar. Iliathin emerged from the temple as a sermon, Hand of Asoyan, saving the girl from the Comorites. From there, a sermon and Ferethel travelled to a broken moon with other like-minded warriors, which they renamed Asur. A sermon trained the warriors, establishing the path of the warrior itself, as well as the Dyravenger Shrine and the Phoenix Lords, or asur The Dyravenger Shrine is the most common of all, due to a sermon's wanderings through as many worlds as possible and his establishment of shrines on more of those worlds than any other Phoenix Lord. The Dire Avengers themselves are more rounded combat troops, able to predict the actions of their opponents and act just as efficiently on offence and defence. A sermon's current fate is unknown. He has died on numerous occasions over the last 12 millennia, including at the hands of the servants of Slanesh herself. But every time he has been reborn with a new Exarch, and has been sighted reportedly from the Eye of Terror to the Eastern Fringe. The first of the Assyria was Ferethel herself. Ferethel was a feral child from the world of Ada Faron, assumedly a sermon's world as well, and just like a sermon, she lost her brother to the demons following the fall. He was killed rather than possessed, but the end result is basically the same. During the attack by the Dark Eldar, her feral nature took over, and she killed some of her attackers, as she lost control. She pleaded with the newly renamed a sermon for him to teach her the discipline she so sorely lacked, and so he renamed her Jane Zar, Storm of Silence. Jane Zar is the founder of the Howling Banshee Shrine, and just like her mentor, she has established a very large number of shrines, second only to a sermon himself. The aspect itself came into being in legend through the crone Morai Heg, and so almost all members of the shrine are female, which is strange among the Eldar, which normally has a much more even gender ratio. They are melee-focused warriors, using swift and precise strikes along with the powerful sonic blast from their banshee mass to incapacitate and destroy their foes. Janezar herself is currently believed to be dead, slain by Talos Valkorin of the Night Lords, who detonated a grenade to kill them both. Of course, an exarch will almost certainly eventually inherit the mantle of Ferethel, returning Janezar to the battlefields of the 41st millennium against the great enemy, Chaos. It is said amongst the Eldar that the finest pupil of a sermon was Baharoth, the cry of the wind. Baharoth's home is unknown, but he was one of the warriors who joined a sermon and Janezar before they settled on a sir, 
and so it can be assumed he is a false survivor like those two, and probably all the other Phoenix Lords. He was the most youthful and exuberant of the Asurya, and he was the first of the winged exarchs. It is said he enjoyed the feeling of the sun on his wings, but as his students all used technology as opposed to biology in order to fly, it may be that he either incorporated biosensors into his own jump pack, or that is simply a metaphor for his back. After all, we have the phrase, sun on your back. The Swooping Hawk Shrine that he founded is the most mobile of all aspect shrines, and the warriors use elaborate ranged weapons to launch rapid aerial assaults with jump packs shaped like wings. They also carry a wide range of grenades, including haywire grenades, in order to tackle armoured targets. Baharoth, whilst a ranged specialist, also wields a mighty sword said to have been forged in the heart of a supernova. The Cry of the Wind is currently alive, as far as we know, though he has died several times over the years. It is said he will meet his final death in the Rana Dandra, an event that we will discuss further towards the end of the video. Baharoth's best friend amongst the other Phoenix Lords is Maugan Ra, the Harvester of Souls. The two are brothers of sorts. They are as much brothers of the Sun and the Moon, which I take to mean that they are reflections of each other in behaviour and fighting style. Maugan Ra hailed from the craft world of Altansar, which initially survived the fall, but was then caught within the pull of the newly formed Eye of Terror, with Maugan Ra the only Eldar to escape the 500-year demise of his home. The Harvester trained under a sermon, but his path following the training was very difficult and different from the Aser Yah. His focus was on long-ranged warfare, controlling the battlefield from afar, and this style was passed on to his students of the Dark Reaper Shrine. He became a master of ranged combat, fashioning unique weapons just as his kin fashioned their blades. His signature weapon, the Maugatar, was fashioned after a long quest by a bone singer, who was subsequently crippled by the Harvester, so it could never be replicated. It combines the Shrieker Cannon used by Harlequin Death Jesters with an Executioner, a power glaive wielded by an exarch of the Howling Banshees, who Margan Ra sacrificed during his quest. The Dark Reapers are more heavily armoured than other Aspect Warriors, though in game they have the same 3 plus armour save as three other shrines. And whilst this slows them down, it does not prevent them unleashing ruin with their mind-linked Reaper launchers. Malgan Ra, like his brother, is currently alive, and most recently has managed to both find and rescue his former craft world from the grasp of the Eye of Terror in the 13th Black Crusade, though his kin did not receive a warm reception due to concerns of corruption after millennia within the Warp, a place which the Eldar never go. For a long time, the Shadow Spectre aspect was considered extinct. This proved to be false when the Shadow Spectres of the long-hidden craft world Mimira emerged and managed to recover the armour of their lost Phoenix Lord Irolith, Shade of Twilight, giving hope of their aspect's rebirth. Irolith, like the other Phoenix Lords, trained under a sermon, but left very soon after following a vision of Mimira's destruction. As he searched for the craft world, he imparted his teachings to the worlds he visited, until becoming embroiled in a battle to prevent Slaneshi demons from breaching the webway. Alone he triumphed, but he fell into a deep slumber, during which he somehow learned of Mimira's true location. He then finally travelled to the lost craft world, teaching them his ways of war before revealing his reason for travelling there. He assured them their doom would now be averted, and he led a war host to eliminate the race that would destroy Mimera before they became a threat, despite knowing that it would cost the lives of himself and his hosts to do so. He fell on a planet known to the Imperium as Vitalis III, and his armour remained there as his host was destroyed and there were no Shadow Spectre Exarchs present to revive him. As a result, the Shadow Spectres fell into decline and then extinction as their shrines were abandoned and their exarchs fell in battle. Except on Mimira, which remained unknown to the rest of the Eldar until they were discovered by rangers of Craftworld Alatok in late M41. These forces then travelled to Batalis III and were able to recover and then resurrect Irolith, meaning the Aspect may eventually return to other Craftworlds again. Irolith and the Shadow Spectres used jetpacks to traverse the battlefield 
at great speeds whilst also utilising stealth, and they use their mighty prison rifles to lay enemy armour low, making them a hybrid of Baharoth swooping hawks, Fugans fire dragons, and Karandrasses striking scorpions. Fugan, the burning lance, is the founder of the fire dragon aspect shrine. He believes that precise destruction can bring harmony to the Eldar, and encourages this view as opposed to the discord created by total oblivion. As such, his warriors ensure that their targets are totally annihilated, and their priorities are enemy vehicles and strongholds. To this end, they carry fusion weapons and melter bombs, capable of destroying armoured behemoths or elite infantry in equal measure. Some exarchs will wield weapons such as flamethrowers or the long-ranged fire pike, whilst Fugan himself also uses a melee weapon called the Fire Axe. Fugan was lost, believed dead, following attack on the Shrine of a Sir where he trained. He reappeared later to aid Eldrad Ulthran of Craftworld Ulthway, destroying dozens of demon commanders to deliver the world of Haran Shemesh. He then disappeared into the webway following the conflict, and was last seen on the planet of Medusa V, which was embroiled in a multi-faction conflict before being swallowed up by the warp. The Eldar were able to achieve their objective on Medusa V, however, sealing off hidden webway gates. Fugin is said to be the Phoenix Lord who will call the Rana Dandra, and that he will be the last of the Asaya to fall in that final battle before the destruction of the Eldar race. The striking scorpion aspect is a unique one. They have had two phoenix lords during their history. The founder of the shrine was Ara, father of scorpions. He taught his warriors the power of stealth and cunning, combined with brutality. They would use the shadows to approach before tearing their foes apart. Ara was flawed, however. His murderous tendencies overtook him with time, and he began to walk the path of damnation the term used by the Eldar to describe their dark kin as they feed off the pain of others to slave and stave off Slaanesh. This corruption saw Ara attack the Shrine of Asur, accompanied by a host of demons. They scattered the other Phoenix Lords among the stars, somehow overwhelming the remaining Asiya and possibly explaining why some Phoenix Lords are currently lost. Now known as the Fallen Phoenix, Ara fled to the Dark Eldar city of Komara, where it is theorised that he founded the Incubus Shrine and became their first hierarch. He disappeared again, and is believed to have returned as Drazhar, Master of Blades and current leader of the Incubi. In response to Ara's betrayal, another exarch was chosen to lead the Striking Scorpions. His name was Karandras, the Shadow Hunter. He became Phoenix Lord of the Striking Scorpions, teaching them patience and discipline to temper the teachings of Ara and prevent other warriors from the corruption that had consumed the Master of Scorpions. As such, the Striking Scorpions are adept in the art of both stealth and melee combat, able to close undetected, wait patiently, and use their unnatural strength to destroy their enemies when the time is right. In more recent history, Karandras is said to have dueled his former mentor Ara on the world of Xandros, which conveniently also has an aspect shrine we know nothing about. The new Phoenix Lord knew he could not defeat the old in straight combat, especially accompanied by Incubi as he was, and so he manipulated the Father of Scorpions into a frenzy. He then faded into shadow, disappearing entirely after their 17-day duel, leaving the enraged Ara to kill all the Incubi who were accompanying him. The final two aspect shrines are the Shining Spears and the Eagle Pilots, and while both shrines have known Phoenix Lords, their stories are either unknown or lacking in any detail. The Eagle Pilots fill the role of fighter pilots when the Eldar wage war. This seems to be very similar to the role of the Crimson Hunters, so I would assume that the Eagle Pilots are the equivalent of the Hunters in the Spacebound fleet, although they explicitly pilot aircraft, not spacecraft. It is stated that they are highly manoeuvrable, so perhaps they engage targets that the Crimson Hunters are unable to track or hit, such as jet bikes or other dogfighters in tricky conditions such as valleys. Their Phoenix Lord is Amon Harakt, and that is literally everything we know about him. Seriously, look it up, there is nothing on this guy. 
My own theory is that he was also Phoenix Lord of the Crimson Hunters, and that one group is a splinter or variation of the other, but there's no evidence for it. The Shining Spear Shrine is composed of warriors on jet bikes, armed with a mighty laser lance, and is renowned for both extraordinary piloting and devastating hit-and-run assaults. They are few in number, but are capable of swinging a combat when their charges hit home. Their Phoenix Lord is Drastanta, the Tempest of Starlight. An arrogant warrior, he was first on the scene following the first death of a sermon at the hands of the Slaneshi Greater Demon, Nkari. He shattered the soul of the Keeper of Secrets with his Celestial Lance, a weapon handed down amongst the Shining Spears after Drastanta left it in their care and disappeared. He has never been seen or heard of since, so is presumed to be quote-unquote dead, or very well hidden like a hermit for no good reason. To conclude, we shall discuss the Phoenix Court of Cain and the Rana Dandra, which we touched on earlier in the video. The Phoenix Court is a legendary formation in which the Phoenix Lords gather, waking an avatar of Cain by sacrificing the spirit of one of the Exarchs who inhabits their spirit stones. Normally, only a single Exarch is chosen as the young king to wake an avatar, and said Exarch had not been chosen to become a Phoenix Lord. So the power of the Phoenix Court's avatar, if it's based on the soul given to it, must be immense. Even if only a single Exarch is chosen, this avatar will still be stronger than average given the power of any warrior who would take the mantle of Phoenix Lord. The court is considered to be naught but myth among the Eldar, which speaks volumes as to the rarity of this thing's formation, and sadly, there are no rules for it in-game that I'm aware of. The Rana Dandra is spoken of in the Asa Yata, the legend of the Phoenix Lords, and is described as the final battle between Chaos and the Material Universe. It states that the Eldar race and their remaining gods, along with both the Material Realm and the Immaterium itself, will perish in the Rana Dandra. The legend states that Fugan will be the one to call the other Phoenix Lords together when the Rana Dandra comes, and that Baharoth will meet his permanent death in that final battle, even though the deaths of the others are implied, it is not explicitly stated, whilst the Burning Lance will be the last to fall. And with the end times hinted to be approaching through Death Mask and Curse of the Wolfen, perhaps the court will soon be gathered to face that final battle. And there we have it. The tales of the Phoenix Lords have been exhausted. Unfortunately for us, there simply isn't enough information for every Lord to get their own video, though I do wish there was, as I'm sure they'd have some amazing tales to tell. If you have any stories from the Warhammer 40,000 universe you'd like me to tell, let me know in the comments below. But for now, it's time to end. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.